Welcome to Live with the Lowe's with your hosts, Father Nicholas and Dr. Roxanne Lowe, where we will connect our Orthodox faith to day-to-day -day living and relationships to our family, our work, and our view of ourselves. Father Nicholas is the priest at St. John the Divine Greek Orthodox Church in Jacksonville, and Dr. Roxanne is a licensed clinical psychologist who uses her extensive training in private practice. Questions are welcome by calling 855-237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Father Nicholas and Dr. Roxanne. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Live with the Lows. It's such an honor to have all of you with us this evening on this Tuesday, April 16th. If you are new to Live with the Lows, it is a show that merges both faith and psychology to give you what we like to call practical Christianity, just to be basically basic tools and really opportunities for you to grow in your faith through um, aspects of the Orthodox Christian faith that merge with psychology to help you and guide you in your faith. So we're so grateful that you're joining us this evening. And before we dive into tonight's really important topic and really cool topic, to be quite honest with you, we do invite you to stay connected to us all throughout the week on our social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Instagram, uh, on YouTube, all under the headings of the Lowe's. And that last name is spelled L-O-U-H-S. Um, we definitely would encourage you to also subscribe to our YouTube, YouTube channel. We have all of our sermons that are archived there at our YouTube channel. So again, you can find us more information about us there as well as on our website, thelows.com. And if you're interested in receiving our daily inspirational messages, we started this several years ago, just with the hope of just trying to inspire people all throughout the week. If you're interested in receiving them, go to our website at thelows.com forward slash subscribe. And all you have to do is simply put in your email address and every single morning at 7 a.m. Eastern, you will receive that day's daily inspirational message. You won't get any other emails. It's just simply our way of just trying to give back to God and try to make a difference in this world. So those are those daily inspirational messages. And as always, we encourage you to stay connected to us and to make uh, to get involved on our show. We'd love to hear from you all throughout the show um, during the live broadcast of our show. And you could do it a number of ways. First, you can call us at one 855 Two three seven twenty three forty six. That's one eight five five two three seven twenty three forty six. Or email us a question at ask at ancientfaith.com. That's a s k at ancientfaith.com. So, friends, let's get started. You know, tonight we are so excited to introduce to you all of you just some very good friends that we have just met um, that are just amazing people in in the Orthodox Church. But before I do that, I do want to share with you all that Roxanne and I love music. We love the Orthodox Christian Byzantine music. We like the liturgical music. But we have to also tell you that we love Christian music in general. And one of our favorite bands is called For King and Country. It's a band that we have seen on a number of occasions that really speaks to us, um, that were very helpful for us when we were going through a difficult time when we were had just lost both of our fathers. And the music that they share was just so inspiring um, and just motivational in our own journey, in our own journey of faith. And so these two, the for King and Country, the two band, uh, the two lead singers are Joel and Luke Smallbone, and they are um, just an extraordinary uh, team, but also their family is extraordinary as well. Uh, their sister that many of you may know is called Rebecca St. James, and she also is very well known for her music and her inspiring Christian music. This, these bands, both of them, Rebecca St. James and For God and Country, are some of the biggest Christian bands in the world right now. And we're so honored because tonight we're interviewing two people that are very much a part of a new movie that's coming out that's about the family, about their story, about what it took for them to become who they are right now, and more importantly, a, a story, a movie that's so moving that we've been so blessed to see about how we deal with setbacks after setback after setback, and still, as we hear the St. John Climacus says, um, says, but to get back up and to continue to climb every step. And so today we're honored to have um, both Jonathan Jackson, who actually has an acting role in this particular movie, called Unsung Hero, as well as Richard Ramsey, who was not only uh, the director, but also one of the screenplay writers. But let me tell you a little bit about them, just so that you know. Um, Jonathan is a multidimensional artist. He's an author, musician, actor, and filmmaker. For many of you who are seeing him, you probably recognize him immediately because he was an actor for many years on General Hospital and there won five Emmy Awards. After many years of working in feature films such as Tuck Everlasting and Insomnia, he played every Barkley in the renowned drama Nashville for six seasons. 
along with international tours with, Nash with the Nashville cast. He is the lead singer and songwriter for the band Jonathan Jackson and E Nation. As an author, he, his works as include the epic poem The Harrowing of Hell and The Mystery of Art, which has been translated into Greek, Romanian, and Russian. And Jonathan is also the associate dean and primary lecturer at Theoria School of Filmmaking. In 2019, he portrayed St. Joseph the Hesychast, an extraordinary saint of the Orthodox Church in a docudrama, which filmed on the Holy Mountain, that of Mount Athos, if you're not familiar with that. This is a peninsula in northern Greece that is um, oftentimes referred to as the Garden of the Virgin Mary, and we'll talk about that probably later on in the show. But over the course of three decades in Hollywood, his journey as an artist, performer, and public speaker has taken him to many places around the world. And it's such an honor to have you, Jonathan, with us. Um, and you can find out more friends about Jonathan by going to his website at www.jonathanjackson.com. And also Richard Ramsey, who directs this film, as well as is one of the screenwriters. And I may, uh, I may be getting that a little bit mixed up as far as if you're the official director, if there were co-directors. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, he is the directors, in my mind, of this movie. And uh, Richard, equally as amazing as an, uh, of an Orthodox Christian as Jonathan is, um, got his B.A. in theater from the University of Houston, spent his early career impacting the independent film world in Texas, his feature film debut, The Song, was released in 2014 in theaters nationwide, and he's the co-director and writer of the upcoming film and feature film, Unsung Hero. And after, six, after a six-year tenure as artistic director of the award-winning City on a Hill studio in Louisville, Richard relocated to Nashville, where he served three years on the creative staff of the Kingdom Story Company. They, um, Richard attends St. Elizabeth Eastern Orthodox Church in Tennessee. So to both Jonathan and Richard, welcome to Live with the Lows. Well, thank you for having thank us. Thank you it's so much. Honor to be here. I mean, we have to just tell you that we just, as we, as we were talking before we got on, just how amazing this movie is. And I just want to tell all of our audience from the very beginning, this is a movie that I want all of you to go and see. And we don't say that often and we don't say that loosely. But Roxanne and I watched this movie earlier today. Um, Unsung Hero is the title of it. And it moved us to tears. It brought us into their story in such an extraordinary way. And I don't know about a lot of us, a lot of you, but uh, we're looking for movies that inspire us and motivate us, not movies that oftentimes are sharing some of the hardest things about in the world, horror or um, things that are just really inappropriate to watch. This is a must-watch film for families to go to. And so, again, thanks, brothers, for being with us. And I just want to begin by simply asking, how did this project actually come about, and how did the two of you get involved with it? Well, I'll jump in because I got involved before Jonathan. So I had worked with um, Joel Smallbone, who I co-directed on Sung Hero with, and he and his brother Ben, who's a character mm -hmm. in the film, but is also a really talented filmmaker in his own right, um, Kingdom Story Company had seen in my writing a proclivity for writing period pieces. And so they partnered me with Joel and Ben, who were working on a project set in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And then when the COVID pandemic happened and everybody went into lockdown, that project got shelved. And so we had to pivot. And Luke, the other brother who's, who is in for King and Country, he had the idea somewhere along the way to tell his family story as a film because they've been telling their family story in some mm -hmm. form or another for yes. years and their sister has too going back to the 90s and so um they approached me at that time about writing that with them because our previous collaboration had gone really well and to be honest i was actually kind of wary because you know when someone comes to you and says hey we think our our story would be a great movie Mm -hmm. You're always kind of like, yeah, well, of course you think that <laughs> you know, everybody, <laughs> everybody thinks that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but as they were telling me some of the details of their story beyond what I'd heard from the stage, I was just found it to be really not only moving and inspiring, but I was like, you know, this really has some compelling mm -hmm. movie moments. I actually mm -hmm. think more than just in addition to being an incredible story, it actually is a good movie. I can, I can see it, you know? And so I agreed to to join them on the quest uh, in the fall of 2020, and it's uh, once I did, I just went in heart and soul, and that was kind of how I started. And and then eventually, um, for just various reasons and other things he had going on in his career, Ben, who was originally going to co-direct it, mm -hmm. he had he decided to step back. I think he thought, you know, we need we need another voice in the mix but beyond just another small bone. Mm -hmm. And so um, Joel asked me to step in and co-direct with him. So that's how that came about. And then from there, 
I'll pass the baton to Jonathan <laughs> because mm-hmm. he was, we reached out to him somewhere along the way. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, Richie and I had met uh, briefly. Um, and so but we didn't really know each other that well. Um, and uh, one of the producers on the film reached out to me and um, said, you know, I'm going to connect you with this project. Um, would love to see if you have any interest in being involved. Um, and I, I, I think you go to the same church as, as the writer and director. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> Cause I, you know, um, I was picturing that they, they thought I was, you know, a part of, you know, some mega church in, in Nashville or something like this. Mm-hmm. And then I paused and I thought, well, wait, there is, the, there is someone that is a writer director. I've met him, but I don't really know him. So, um, turns out that that was the case. And, um, you know, so I, I got the script, um, and I can't remember if we spoke, Richie, before I'd read the script. I think we did, maybe. There was a I Zoom call I think we, we with briefly you. had a Zoom call with me and yeah, Joel and with you. Yeah, with Joel. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and so it, it seemed like I, it's always tricky when, you know, when you're sent something because you just never know how you're going to react to it. And, and um, I've always kind of steered clear of overtly – uh, faith-based films, because historically speaking, they just haven't been necessarily artistically the the most um, maybe honest or uh, mm-hmm. powerful films, unfortunately. Yeah, and so and that's changing, you know, uh, which is which is amazing. But I read the script on an airplane, and um, I. I had a similar reaction perhaps to what you both had today watching the film. I was just in tears and I turned to my wife and I said, this is a, this is an incredibly beautiful and powerful story. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just really the kind of storytelling that, um, I just feel like needs to be Mm -hmm. out there more and more in the world and not to embarrass Richie, but truly, um, uh, he and, and Joel and everybody involved, there was such attention to detail and honesty, um, mm-hmm. which is something that has been a bit lacking in, in a lot of, you know, films that are kind of overtly have faith connected, which again is really sad. Um, but they just, they found these moments throughout the entire story that are, are universal, they're personal, they're honest. They're not afraid of uh, having moments of paradox and conflict. Um, in my experience, the Orthodox faith is is absolutely prime for the arts. You know, mm-hmm. so um, I feel like it added a a kind of poetic depth um, mm-hmm. to this story. That's absolutely Thank beautiful. You. I mean, it, you know, in their concerts, you know, they they kind of shed a little bit of light on the, the tremendous blessings they received and their difficult story growing up. And I, you know, I never knew exactly what happened in their life. I mean, they, they shed light on this, mm-hmm. but, but to see it, you know, the breakthrough of blessings amidst all the setbacks, I mean, you know, and, and this is the struggle we face, right, in life. I mean, the, you know, the Christian life is is fret, full of battles and blessings constantly, simultaneously. Things go well, and then they're shattered, right? And so yeah. I love what you're sharing, that, that there was so much truth and honesty, mm-hmm. like a very real look into a very real family, um, yes. you know, and how they how they came back from so many setbacks was, was just so believable too, right? Um, and their faith was inspirational. I want to ask you both, you know, what we see in the movies is not usually this, right? In fact, we usually have a hard time trying to find, you know, what's a movie we can actually take our kids to, you Mm -hmm. know, what's a movie we're going to be able to watch and not feel uncomfortable, like a visceral reaction in terms of what we're, you know, experiencing ourselves. And I commend you both for taking on a project that's fretful of um, inspiration and meaning and beauty and depth and faith. 
Um, and so I'd love to ask you both, um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on, on the demand for, you know, this sort of, you know, faith-based film in, in a society fretful of everything mm-hmm. that's not? Mm-hmm. Richie? Um, I've seen a lot of digital ink spilt in recent years about, you know, what people are calling a crisis of meaning. You know, mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. you have a lot of sort of systematic secularization of culture and you know it's hard to tell people hey the universe began with no meaning and it will end with no meaning but you Mm -hmm. can fashion some kind of meaning in the middle and expect people Mm -hmm. to flourish you know Mm -hmm. um and i think people are starved for the oxygen of meaning and hope that their Mm -hmm. lives matter um that they're created for a purpose and by someone who loves them um and wants to save them and redeem them and redeem their struggles and use their struggles for their good. I think people are starving for that right now um, Mm -hmm. because it has been kind of shoved into, you know, it's been very privatized. Like, you know, that's, that's to be compartmentalized in your church building. It's can be compartmentalized maybe around your kitchen table, Mm -hmm. but it really has no proper place or to have no influence beyond that. And I think that leaves a vacuum where people, you know, your soul can't flourish when that's the constant messaging you're Mm -hmm. getting. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that starved for meaning. I mean, I would, I would echo that a thousand mm-hmm. percent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jonathan, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I mean, I, yeah, I would echo that as well. Um, I mean, within, within that uh, theme of meaning, um, you know, I often hearken back to Dostoevsky's beauty will save the world. Um, and as some of these timeless and, um, truly mystical uh, realities like marriage and family um, continue to be um, pushed aside uh, and kind of lost uh, in society. What that means also is that the beauty of marriage and family becomes that much more mm-hmm. uh, important mm-hmm. for people to experience. And um, as I kind of mentioned before, I think that um, it's uh, historically speaking, I think the role of artists ha- has been quite, you know, kind of central to the experience, the sort of um, Christian experience. And America is a very interesting place. Um, but somehow, you know, as, as Richie was saying before, somehow things have been com- compartmentalized, you know, and it's, uh, Christian music is on Christian radio and Christian films are in this Christian, you know, subculture. And, um, and, and it's, I don't believe it's supposed to be that way at all because what we're really talking about is life. We're, we're talking about Mm. life and meaning and beauty and darkness and hope and all of these things. So again, I, I, for me, um, the honesty that is, uh, you know, within the Orthodox, tradition in in particular kind of in in many ways frees artists to embrace uh, the paradoxes that are inherent in the human experience and um, that's certainly something that you know Richie and Joel and everybody involved uh, embraced and and you know as an audience I'm sort of I'm I feel incredibly blessed to even be a part of this project I'm a I'm kind of like a fan of the, pro- mm-hmm. of the project, you know, mm-hmm. that's what I feel like. I'm, I'm in the audience in tears and, and, uh, you know, and, and for those reasons, because it's portraying, um, life and struggle and suffering and faith in a way that is authentic and real. We desperately need that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Right. I think in the, Almost this, ro- um, almost this romanticization of Christianity, this idea that Christianity is just going to be, if, if you just have faith, everything's going to work out, and, that, uh, and almost this idea that um, negative things or bad things can't happen to people that are, that are, or why are they happening? And I think it's so important in Orthodox Christianity as we're journeying through this season of Lent, one of the things that we hear over and over again, and we hear this during Holy Week where Christ tells his disciples and really is talking to all of us, in the 16th chapter of John, where, listen, you're going to face 
setback after setback, even with your intention is good, when you're, even when you're all the things that you feel that are doing right, you're doing right, you're still going to face setbacks. And I think one of the most beautiful statements that we hear during Holy Week, as far as, uh, without, with the exception of obviously the, the phrase, Christ is risen, is this, that when Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, but take heart because I've already overcome the world. And it is a reminder that yes, what we may think is out of our control is never out of his control. Um, but to recognize mm-hmm. that those struggles that we face in life, they're going to happen to all of us. Um, and recognizing that God is using those, that pain, as we oftentimes talk about, for a greater purpose. Um, and um, I just, this movie, when I look at the father, when I look at Helen, the mother, when I look at just all the different characters, every one of them, you could argue, went through their own setbacks. Even the kids were wanting something that, um, you know, imagine picking up your family and, and we don't want to spoil the, 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 the mm-hmm. plot, but I mean, just, sure, the, sure. just the, what they went through, I mean, it was just extraordinary. Um, I do want to just ask both of you because um, I know many of our audience are non-Orthodox and, and there are mm-hmm. those that, who are Orthodox, but I... I think just for me, um, and maybe before I ask you this question, I do want to just invite our listeners, if you'd like to speak with Jonathan Taylor or Richard Ramsey, these, we're talking about this new movie called Unsung Hero that I encourage all of you to find, um, to, to just research about. You can find out more by going to unsunghero.movie. Um, it's an extraordinary movie that Roxanne and I both saw earlier today and was so moving on. It's probably one of the best uh, films that we have seen in a long, long time. But if you're interested in calling and speaking with them, thank you, um, to Richard or to Jonathan, feel free to call us at 1-855-237-2346. That's 1-855-237-2346. Or email us a question at ask, that's A-S-K, at ancientfaith.com. You know, I think, Jonathan, I'd like to start with you. I mean, when, when you were, you know, preparing as you as only an actor does, I, you know, it's, a, it's something that I'm not too familiar with, but as an actor, there's so much preparation to get into that character. And uh, your character is really a game changer, game changing character within the movie. But I do want to know, you know, you're, you're such a, um, you're like all of us, we're on this journey, this Orthodox Christian journey. Um, but I'd love to know, did your faith impact you in, in the way in which you portrayed your character? And if so, how? And then obviously, um, you know, Richard, as you're the screenplay, you're, you're in charge of this, um, the screenplay. I mean, did that impact how you wrote and how you um, kind of had different things that were emphasized within the movie? So, Jonathan, if you don't mind starting us out. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the answer to that would be yes. Um, and I think that's primarily because um, faith, you know, especially as I get older uh, and journeying into um, the Orthodox Church, it's that um, that sort of patristic vision, you could say, that the whole world is a sacrament kind of breaks down a lot of barriers, mm-hmm. whereas before it might be a perspective of, you know, on Sundays, I'm really focused on God. I go to church and when I'm at work, it's work. And, you know, everything's kind of, um, partitioned off. Um, so now it feels like everything that is being approached, whether it's an acting role or, um, writing a song, um, or spending time with my children, whatever it is, um, there is that sense of approaching it, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, with a sense of humility, a sense of focus, a sense of uh, doing the work, but also letting go and trusting God. Um, the Jesus prayer is, is uh, you know, kind of, mm-hmm. there. Are, it's become over the years, um, not just in life, but even in, in work, um, you know, really important and central to me. So this character was interesting because he's quite, different and eccentric and out mm-hmm. there. He kind of has loud, loud hair and loud clothes. <laughs> but kind of a, we were going to ask you about we that. We were going to ask you of, what that hair was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it, the, one of the paradoxes there that I, I found interesting was, you know, kind of big hair, big clothing, but kind of soft-spoken poetic right, soul in right, a way, right. you know? And, and uh, I think if you have someone with this, you know, large external who is – just big and out there it's like okay that's fine but it it was it's more interesting for me to kind of look for those contradictions so Mm -hmm. um yeah but it's you know and 
it, it was the, the movie as a whole, you know, that I was really drawn to. Um, and then mm. the character was the secondary thing. I thought, well, this could be fun. I mean, mm-hmm. this is different. So right. I don't know. <laughs> I love that. Richard, yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear just in, in your preparation how, how influential your faith yeah. was in that. Well, I would say I had a pretty profound, uh, distinctly orthodox experience in the making of the film, mm. and it's this. So when I first, you know, when I first set out to start writing the script, you know, you have a family of nine. So you're like, okay, in this family of nine, who is the main character? You know, mm. you have a, you know, you can have situations where there's what you call a group protagonist, but you still need like a main character to latch on to. And it was apparent, you know, David's actions and choices drive a lot of the plot. Right. He's probably going to have the most profound change, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's the best main character for this movie. So what I did is early on, I pitched to the brothers, hey, what if the main character is Rebecca? And it's kind of her coming of age story. And through her eyes, we see all of this unfold. Mm. And they were like, great. And I presented this outline, walked them through the whole story. And they were like, great. We love it. Do that. And so I was really excited. And I thought, oh, this will be great. I'm really excited. I'm doing this. But I had this really nagging like voice in the back of my head. Because when I'd interviewed everybody for the film to kind of glean the story from them for research, it was really apparent to me that motherhood was extremely mm. important to Helen and that it, it was extremely important to Rebecca. Um, and so one of the things I was worried about and this little sort of haunting voice in the back of my head was, well, what are you going to do with Helen? Mm. You know, and it would be really sh- a shame for her to just be this sort of very low key background character. It just, it would be, a sh- it would just be kind of giving her short shrift. It would be giving motherhood perhaps short shrift. Mm-hmm. And so, I was, I was, you know, kind of anxious about this, but I was kind of plowing ahead anyway. But I, I decided, you know, as I was sort of getting, I was very new to orthodoxy too. I was, and I still am, but I was, a, I was an inquirer at this point. I wasn't even a catechumen, mm. but sort of learning about, you know, the orthodox, um, you know, Jesus said that God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead to him. All are alive. The prayers of a righteous person availeth much Mm -hmm. his mother was the one who convinced him to turn the water into Mm -hmm. wine and so i was like okay i have this nagging fear that this movie is going to shortchange mothers and i wanted to honor motherhood Mm -hmm. and mothers so maybe this is a time to you know cross that threshold and approach the the ultimate (laughs) mother Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so Mm -hmm. i literally was like you know, asking for the intercessory prayers of, of Mary, the Theotokos and said, I pray that this film would honor motherhood and mothers and that it would lift up your son so that all people will be drawn unto him that see this film. And I prayed this for about a month as I'm writing the script. I got about 25 pages into the script. I handed over to Joel and Luke and the team and it kind of fell flat. And then they call me up after, you know, we had a hard meeting where they were telling me all their notes. And then they called me up with and said, hey, we've been talking and Luke has an idea. We think it should be called Unsung Hero. It should be told from Helen's point of view. And the film's kind of a love letter to mothers. Wow. And if I were just a screenwriter reacting like out of my flesh and out of my ego, <laughs> I would have been like, that's it. You guys don't know what you want. I, you're yeah. sending me on these wild goose chases. I'm out of here. Get somebody who can put up with all this. <laughs> but I was like, this would normally be immensely frustrating. But today it is a conspicuously answered prayer. Wow. And so. Um, Glory to God. Yeah. That yeah. Is so that was. Uh, <laughs> That is so that was a, a monumental moment for me uh, in my Orthodox journey. Um, I, I can I can tell so, yeah. you as as a mother, mm. uh, she is who Absolutely. I literally connected to was crying with the like the entire time. This <laughs> sort of dynamic that mm. she brought, uh, you know, her strength, her glue, her sacrifice, and her continued transcendent faith through every moment. I mean, she was so strong. She was just Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, what an example for every mother. And I kept coming back to inspired me as a mother. How am Mm -hmm. I the glue, you know? And, and so in terms of sort of 
honoring his son, your initial prayer. I mean, she did all of that. Mm -hmm. And then with a whole bunch of mm -hmm. humility on top, mm -hmm. you know, right. I mean, couldn't have been right. more the picture of Mary mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and in, in honoring Christ. And so what a, that is an answered prayer on a hundred levels. <laughs> <It's beautiful. laughs> would it, would it be okay just to, if, if, you know, I'd love to ask you both. Uh, I mean, just, I know that times of the essence, but I think for a lot of our audience, they'd love to know just your journey into the church um, and, and maybe, you know, Richard, if you felt comfortable, maybe to share, you know, just a, a few moments uh, about what drew you to the Orthodox Church. I mean, because I love the fact that you were quite, you weren't Orthodox at the time when this began, but yet you were drawing mm -hmm. on the prayers um, and really the, the um, we say the fronima, you know, the, the mindset of the Orthodox right. Church, you were, it, you were tying that mm -hmm. into your work already. And that's just, uh, that's hard for a lot of us who've been Orthodox our entire lives to actually to do that. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear your story about that. Well, I'd had some touch points with Orthodoxy. So I, I come from an evangelical background, for which I'm immensely grateful. You mm -hmm. know, I don't consider myself some sort of deconstructed ex-evangelical. I don't walk. You know, I heard someone recently say a priest say, you know, don't go through life walking backwards, cursing on your past and the people mm -hmm. who shaped you. And of course, I really right. thought that was beautifully said, and I definitely want to honor that. Um, and but um, I, I'd had some touch points with orthodoxy. Um, I had a chance to go to Romania about 15 years ago. So there was a touch point. I um, heard the deep Jesus prayer. I, I had actually prayed that in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we moved to Nashville a few years ago, we live in remarkably close proximity to an Orthodox church. And <laughs> I was pretty daunted by the prospect of quote unquote church shopping in Nashville. Um, I liken it mm -hmm. to when you get on like Netflix at like 1030 at night trying to figure out what to watch <laughs> and you, you just, just get scroll. option paralysis, just right? Exactly. <laughs> just option scroll. paralysis is a great term. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we couldn't, you know, we, this, we drove by this Orthodox church every day. And so I, my wife and I were like, you know, it's, it's now or never. So we, we, we ventured into it and our church is not particularly as far as it's building itself it's not particularly grand it's not the Hagia Sophia I'm so new to orthodoxy I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right um, perfect it's yeah. not okay thank you it's not Notre Dame you know mm -hmm. it's 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 a pretty as far as orthodox churches go it's a pretty utilitarian space and we're actually hoping to get a new one in the coming years um, but even there walking in I was immediately struck by there's there was just a spirit of gentleness mm -hmm. and meekness and I would even say sweetness while at the same time a spirit of something that seemed to say don't mess with me. Mm. I'm not to be trifled with. You know, if you mm -hmm. if you want to come here with your hot takes and your new ideas and you want to shake things up like this is not the place. <laughs> and mm. so I found that stability with that and that sturdiness. You know, Jesus said on the rock, I will build my church. Mm -hmm. That solid foundation with that gen gentleness. I just was, I found that so compelling. And then I've had experiences since, but that was just on my first visit. And so we, we kept going and then we were, baptized into the church in February of 2022. Beautiful. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful. And Jonathan, yeah. I'd love to hear, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you've shared your story many a time um, in, in different speaking engagements, but just that for our audience to share us your story. Well, um, I think the first uh, encounter happened before I understood what I was encountering. Um, mm. And funny enough, it was in Romania as well. Um, I was, wow. I was, I was shooting a film in Romania and, uh, um, my wife and I ventured into a very, very small little church and it was just covered with icons. I mean, there was almost not an inch of space it seemed because it was, it was such a small little space. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to make of it. Um, and, and really, um, I'm sort of ashamed to say, but I, I kind of just compartmentalized that I thought this is probably because I come from a, you know, pr some form of Protestant background, but I thought this is maybe this is some kind of odd offshoot of, you know, Roman Catholicism. And mm -hmm. I just didn't think too much of it. Um, 
But then we went to Rome, Italy for a week. Um, I had a little bit of time off of work and, and my wife's Italian. So we thought, oh, this would be amazing to go to Rome. And it happened to be Palm Sunday mm. when we arrived. And we were there for about six days. Um, and it just, uh, it changed our lives. There was something happening inside of us that we didn't understand. Um, witnessing these ancient places, you know, going to the Colosseum and realizing that, that there were martyrs um, that gave their life for Christ, that, that Peter and uh, St. Peter and Paul walked, you know, mm -hmm. um, here. Um, it, it was something was calling to us. And I remember looking, you know, over to my wife and saying, I, I have to read Christian history. Um, I, I want to know how we got to where we are. Because mm -hmm. um, I was kind of involved in the charismatic, at this point, the more charismatic Protestant world. You know, and like like Richie said, I have a lot. There's a lot of gratitude in my heart for, all, you know, the journey for for sure. But but there was there was something that I felt was missing. Um, I didn't really understand what the the purpose of of going to church was exactly. Um, and I just thought, you know, I love the scriptures. I love Christ, and I don't know anything about what happened when, after the apostles died until Martin Luther, and that's a pretty big gap. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and I didn't know what the I was going to find. It, yeah. The history books tend yeah, to stop right that time. <laughs> yeah, but it, it honestly, it was a, it was a sincere search for truth. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I said to myself, to Elisa, my wife, to, you know, to the Lord in prayer, I just want, I want the truth. Um, I don't know where it's going to lead. And so it was about almost probably four years of actively searching um, mm -hmm. and reading as much as I could and praying uh, before I really ever, before orthodoxy ever came into the picture. And it was a mm -hmm. dark night of the soul where I was praying at two in the morning I, and um, uh, just saying, Lord, you know, I don't understand what, where, where is your church? You said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And because at this point, I'd, re I'd read a lot of the fathers of the church, and I couldn't find that faith anywhere. Mm. I couldn't mm -hmm. find that vision anywhere. Um, and this little thought, small voice said, look at the great schism. And um, so I thought, yeah, the great schism. I remember that phrase. And I, I, as soon as I looked that up and really actually focused in on it, this you know sp split between the East and West and... Um, it was like not only the last four years at that point, but kind of my whole life with Christ ever since I was a child, it all started to kind of click. The stars, mm. you know, kind of began to align because I think as a Protestant, you have these instincts about who Christ is and what the church is, but you just, you don't see it, mm -hmm. um, mm. fully realized. And, um, all of the poetry and beauty and mysticism and silence and prayer and uh, all of those things that are kind of, I think, just intuitively in our souls looking for a place to house it. Um, mm -hmm. it, it for me, I, it, it wasn't able to be housed um, until, uh, until we encountered, you know, the ancient faith. I, I just love hearing yeah, you both talk about that. And, um you know, for us, uh, for me, it was one of those things that was a little bit of an opposite where um, I grew up in the, orth in the Greek Orthodox Church. In fact, the church that I'm serving as the priest at is the church that I grew up in. And, oh, um, wow. and so and I'm serving as, a, uh, as the priest there. And I'm sure some of the people there could say to you, Richard, can you do a screenplay on that? <laughs> you know, you know. But, uh, but, you know, but when I was in high school, I, I kind of questioned faith in general. I mean, and... Uh, I had a very good friend of mine who was part of a, a, a Baptist a church here in Jacksonville and said, why don't you come to the church with me and we're having a youth night and I didn't think much of it. I just thought, well, let's just go there. And long story short, they were, all I knew growing up was that the Orthodox church was the true church. That's all I knew, but I didn't know why it was that. And um, I, the youth pastor there had asked all the, every one of the guests that, that each of the young people had brought to be there that night, you know, what church are you from? And all I, so when they asked me, I was like, my name is Nick Lowe and I am, 
Orthodox, and we are the true church. And have you ever heard of the <laughs> Orthodox Church? And uh, he set me on a course for me to fall back in love with my church um, because he simply replied, hmm. he said, Nick, he goes, I've studied the Orthodox Church and I love the Orthodox Church. He goes, and then he followed it up with a question. He says, why are you Orthodox? Hmm. What is your relation? Why do you have icons? Why do you have, you know, and I never, you know, I, I wish I was smart enough and mature enough at that time to really connect with him, you know, to get his information because long story short, I would just take, you know, I would go on fire for my faith because as he was asking me these questions, I could not respond. And I would simply resp mm -hmm. simply just be like, uh, yeah, uh, well, we just do. We just do. But never knowing why we do that. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. once that actually my very first meeting after becoming a priest was I drove down to that church, which is a, which is a very large mega church down here, downtown, a, a Baptist church here in Jacksonville, and met with mm -hmm. the head pastor and that youth pastor is no longer there working. But simply said that, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I'm I'm in love with my church, but I have to tell you that this church was very, you know, inspiring mm -hmm. and was very important in my own journey. So I have a very Absolutely. special place in my heart for um, the, the Protestant church, uh, not because we're in competition at the end of the day, in my belief that we're all on the same team. We're all yearning to get to the same place. There are differences, stark differences between our churches, and sure. we can't overlook that. But I do think that God is yearning for us as we pray in the divine liturgy for the unity of us all. I mean, that's what he's yearning yes. for. So, Absolutely. Um, we're going to take a quick break, brothers, and on the other side of the break, we're going to continue this conversation, friends, with uh, Jonathan Taylor and Richard Ramsey on this brand new movie coming out on, on April 26th that you have to go see called Unsung Hero. We'll be right back. Live with the Lows with Father Nick and Dr. Roxanne will be back in a moment. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. They would love to hear from you. St. Paisio said, Every day you should try to plant in your soul something spiritual, which will eject something worldly and sinful. Replace the sinful images in your mind with holy ones. AthenightUSA.com offers holy icons for those wishing to plant something spiritual in their souls. Immaculate 22 karat gold leaf hand applied on solid wood. A lifelong gift for yourself and someone you care for. Use the code FAITH for free shipping. Come and see AthenightUSA.com. back with Live with the Lowe's and Father Nick and Dr. Roxanne. Do you have a question for the Lowe's? Call in now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Here once again is Father Nick and Dr. Roxanne. Welcome back, everyone, to Live with the Lowe's. So grateful that you're joining us tonight. And before we get back to our special guest, I do want to once again remind all of you of our brand new book called Six Hours, Seven Lessons, How Christ's Light Transcends Our Darkness. This book um, basically chronicles the final six hours that Christ is on the, on the cross, at least that's what's reflected in Scripture, and the seven extraordinary statements that he makes um, on the cross. We oftentimes tell people that on the darkest day of Christ's life, we call it Good Friday or Great Friday in the Orthodox Church. It was great for us, but terrible for Christ. But in that moment, on that cross, he was thinking about us. And so this book, like Renewing You, our first book, merges both faith and psychology to kind of chronicle every one of these statements. And so you can find out more by going to store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. And again, the book is titled Six Hours, Seven Lessons. So friends, tonight we've been talking about a great movie that's coming up. And we don't oftentimes talk about movies on our show, but this particular one, we really want to encourage you all to go and see. It's called Unsung Hero. And earlier today, Roxanne and I saw this movie just was absolutely blown away by it. It tugged at our heart. It inspired us in our own walk of faith. And tonight we're so blessed to have both Richard Ramsey, who's the screenwriter and director of this movie, along with Jonathan Taylor, who actually is one of the actors in the movie. They are both Orthodox Christians, and we're so honored that they're joining us tonight. So again, brothers, thank you so much for being with us this evening. So Thank there is you. a moment in the film, and, and this is a moment where we both, you know, looked at each other and just said, 
wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, we did at that moment. And it said, you know, your, your family isn't in the way. They are the way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we did. We both had the. I was wow. like, write that we're, down. We're like, write that I'm, down. I'm, I'm going mean, to use that in a well, sermon. That was excellent. It's it was just. just <laughs> It's just beautiful, yes. um, you know. So, talk to us a little bit about what that meant to you, and why it's really at the heart of Unsung Hero. Well, this is kind of a first, a full circle moment because I was a, when we were kind of getting into a late stage of the screenwriting process. I was listening to, I believe it was the Areopagus podcast, which is mm -hmm. another ancient faith show, and I haven't met Father Andrew Stephen Damick, but I was listening to his podcast. And he was telling a story, if I remember the story correctly, either another priest had said that to him or had said it to another priest and he was recounting mm. the story that, wow. you know, someone had said, your family, they're not, he said, he said, you know, your family's not in the way they are the way. Mm -hmm. And I admittedly was like, oh, that's, that's gold. That's great. You know, and mm -hmm. it was at a phase in the script where I saw it was pretty on theme for us. And so I actually mentioned it when we were, again, we were getting into the final stages of the script. And everybody just really kind of took to it. They're like, that's real. Wow. <laughs> and so mm. we put it in the script. We had a kind of a hard time at first kind of figuring out who should say it. And ultimately we have, as it's shown in the trailers, um, the, the, um, the grandfather, you know, David's father says it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's kind of just taken off. So it's been interesting because, you know, a lot of Protestants and evangelicals are um, rallying around the film for obvious reasons. And, you know, um, uh, that's still where, you know, that's, that's where the small bones are and that's where they come from. Um, but it's been really interesting to see that phrase just catch fire. Um, almost to the point where I'm hoping I'm not getting myself in some legal trouble by admitting I lifted it from here. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Well, that's um, the beauty of the Orthodox Church. If you give credit, yes, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so, so, so yeah, prophetic actually, for the a, film. I mean, yeah, it really right. Is so it remarkable. actually, I actually heard that on Ancient Faith for the first time, and then oh, wow. just kind of was like, if we could work that in some way. Um, and again, if I'd heard it like at, right at the very beginning of writing, I don't know if I would have thought to fit it in. It just, I heard it at like the right time to think it could integrate in. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how that happened. And, and then uh, as far as the phrase itself, you know, it, it, it just resonates because we do get all this messaging, I think in our culture and not all family, you know, uh, not all message about the family in our culture is bad all the time, but there's a lot of negative messaging. One of them being that family is, if anything, the obstacle to personal fulfillment and satisfaction, and even sometimes to being a good person. Like, oh, I, I would be a saint if I didn't have to put up with all of this nonsense mm -hmm. around me. Yeah, you know, so you, bring, you people bring out the worst in me. And um, what if all, what if the opposite of all of that is true? And what if the things, you know, your blow ups or you're losing your temper, or your frustrations mm -hmm. or your sighing? And what if that's actually God revealing some things about you that need to be dealt with and cleaned out? I think, you know, your, your family, um, can be one of the things that God does use to um, make you more holy and to bring you to salvation. Absolutely. Oh, that's Absolutely. just so beautiful. Absolutely. Let me ask you both. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I mean, I, I know that there has been a, a little change as far as faith films. And, and, and that, what I mean by that is that you're, uh, without, without trying to sound too kind of, um, Categorical. I mean, there was a time in which faith films were kind of a little, uh, maybe a little cheesy. I mean, they weren't, you know, you, you didn't really feel like you got to the deep end of the pool of faith. It was kind of just like a very shallow kind of, um, you know, God loves you and that's, you know, and, and really you didn't really kind of see or experience. or you couldn't or, connect. Yeah, to, exactly. To take, yeah. and I, I think that this movie obviously does that for both of us. But, I mean, what would you say to anyone that's skeptical um, that, that this, about this particular film and why it's so, in your, and for both of you, why is it so important for them to also watch it as well? You know, Jonathan, I'll start oh, with you, brother. Sense. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, um, I mean, that's a great question. Um, it, it, it's sort of difficult to answer in some ways for me because um, I think my instinct around uh, experiencing uh, works of art, whether it's, you know, music, <clears throat> albums, uh, film, anything like that, is um, I can't really authenticate it for anyone else. Mm 
you know. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite films of all time is Braveheart. And, you know, uh, I, I, could, I could tell someone, you know, 15 different things why it's, it's such a great film. And none of it's really going to mean anything until that person watches it themselves and experiences it. So, um, you know, I can certainly say that uh, this, this film, Unsung Hero, touched me very deeply uh, when I read the script. Um, when I watched the film, um, you know, I was, I was in tears. It's, it's very heartfelt and meaningful. But ultimately these things have to be, uh, experienced, mm -hmm. um, you know? And so I don't know, I, I, I always, I always hesitate to almost, um, and, and I also don't want to rob the mystery of, you know, for it, for someone. Um, so it, I'm terrible with marketing because, um, <laughs> my instinct is to say <laughs> is to undersell <laughs> something so that people can experience it for themselves and not have mm. their expectations be too high. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that, that, yeah, I would say I, I'm deeply moved by it. My wife was, my children were, um, but you know, I don't know what else to say. Besides Richard, that. Richard, I mean, I, I totally agree with you too, uh, Jonathan. I mean, my, my thought is that everyone's lens by which they look at things is going to be different because we all have different experiences and it touches us in different ways. I, our fathers both passed away, um, uh, you know, several years ago, that's really the impetus behind our ministry that we do. And um, that moment, um, I'll just leave in the hospital, just brought, there was a moment of just quietness. And I was like, oh my gosh, I hope that whatever was happening did not happen. And because uh, I was reminding us of our fathers, but, um, and we lost it at that moment as well. <laughs> so uh, thanks to you, uh, Richard, for doing that. We went through a whole box of Kleenex. But Richard, I mean, I think for, you know, just to kind of continue the conversation, I mean, um, why, you know, when you, you know, obviously you were the screenwriter, but I mean, obviously you were, you were putting in your life into this. Not only was it their life, but there was, I'm sure there's parts of your own spirituality, your own faith yeah, that's that you I were tying, too. And, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. I'd love to just kind of hear that. Yeah, so I think something I was processing through this was, um, you know, I had a film come out about a decade ago that um, I had a lot of hopes for and it didn't uh, perform very well. And then that kicked off this kind of weird sort of seven year sojourn in the wilderness where I would be working on projects and then for whatever crazy reason, they'd seem to be getting some traction and some momentum and they would just fizzle. And, um, and you know, I mentioned before the project I was working on that we had to pivot away from when, when COVID, you know, happened. And so for me, um, it was interesting in this film to process just, you know, what does failure look like, you know, in our psychology? What does it look like mm -hmm. in our faith? How does it affect our relationships with other people? How does it affect mm -hmm. our sense of self-worth? Um, and, um, you know, once you have a dream and that dream dies, you get this sort of mindset of, well, anything bad could happen, you know, mm -hmm. and it's hard to it can be hard to hope. And, um, but I think one thing too, that was great. And I think it's something that's so built into the small bone family is they're such optimist, um, yes. at heart. And a lot of the things we did, you know, in the film was sort of externalizing what were more of their internal struggles. But in addition to, you know, it deals with some hard things and it deals with some, some tough aspects of life. Um, they have such joy and optimism that I think that comes through in the movie as well. There's a lot of levity and a lot of, um, you know, if I may say so, I've, I've seen it with audiences and a lot of laughter. Um, and the kids bring a lot of just sort of joy and spark to the film. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was interesting to explore, you know, failure, but also having hope at the same time and just persevering because while there's a temptation to despair and things look really, really bleak and dire, you just, you still persevere in hope because you, at the end of the day, you know, like the Psalm says, who have I in heaven, but you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and when you're at that point in life, there is a kind of weird, odd hope in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we just have a few minutes left of the show and I did want to ask you both, um, you know, I love the title of Unsung Heroes. I think that just it's it's powerful in so many different ways. Um, in your when you look at your own lives, I mean, uh, maybe Jonathan, if you could share and then and then follow, we'll just conclude with you, Richard. I mean, who are some unsung heroes that really have helped to shape who you are today in your own life and in your walk of faith? 
Well, I mean, certainly um, my, my parents, both my father and my mother, um, have just, I mean, um, the, <clears throat> the love that they, um, they showed, um, I, I'm eternally thankful for. Um, and my wife, um, who I really can't imagine uh, my life without her, um, and then, you know, I would say also there have been some, some people throughout the years, um, uh, mentors, you know, that, that mm -hmm. have helped shape who, who I am and um, inspired me and sheltered me at times from certain slings and arrows mm -hmm. um, that I'm incredibly grateful for. Uh, Anthony Geary, who played my father on General Hospital, was one of those people, and Jeannie Francis as well. Um, so there are, there are so many, um, but you know, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's another thing I just really love about this, this film. It's, you know, I don't remember who said it. I think many people have, but the, the phrase is the more personal something is the more universal it mm. becomes. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a writer, whether it's screenwriting or songwriting, I, I, I think it, it's true. And, and, uh, Richie and Joel, um, you know, they, they really, um, I found that to be the case. Some of these things are, they're so personal, uh, that they just become universal people watching it mm -hmm. go, yeah, I felt that way. I've been mm -hmm. through that. Exactly. I understand what that feels like. Yeah. And you're so talented at bringing out those internal qualities. Mm -hmm. I mean, not every film can you can you see those internal qualities right. made external, and that's what I really yes. felt. I, I, I've never. I, I, it's very rare that I can experience somebody's inner world like mm -hmm. like the way it came out in this in this film. And Richard, for you as well. Yeah. So, um, my wife, um, if 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 it weren't for her. You know, my my uh, pretty much every facet of my life would take a noticeable dive, including my work. Um, I don't think and I appreciate all of your your compliments on the film, uh, but I, I don't think, you know, I, I, I think a lot of that I have to attribute to her and her mm. um, giving me honest feedback at times, um, sometimes. <laughs> I, I know honest. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah. And um, so definitely her, my parents as well. And then I had some really, I think, crucial educators, you know, as someone who took an interest in the arts very young. I had a really formative theater teacher in high school, and I was blessed to go on to do theater in college under some really great mentors and professors. And so, um, and they still, I mean, they they were formative in shaping my taste and to this day mm. I can wow. I still have them in my head you know when I'm working on a project um mm. and so yeah um and I'm, I'm excited about a film that sort of celebrates those people who are mm -hmm. kind of behind the scenes and you know um there's a there's a quote at the end of the film it's it's paraphrased but the gist it it you know, it's by Mother Teresa that if you want to change the oh, world, go mm -hmm. home and love your family. And <laughs> another moment we think, when we <laughs> look yeah, at each yeah. other. Well, and, uh, and another, it's like often we think the world has changed through grandiose schemes and activism right. and, right. you know, political, social engineering. And that does have its effects for sure. But sometimes life is just altered by the quiet, hidden, unseen things that, mm -hmm. that only God mm -hmm. sees. And um, and it's it's been really exciting to be part of a film that celebrates that. All right. I mean, God I think, bless you both and yeah. what you're doing. Oh, um, thank you, thank you. And the hope you. that you know, we if we if everyone is just simply changing their little world, and then we can change the world, and and really encouraging yeah. us that. And it's so, uh, like I said, I, for for those of you that are tuning in, and or if you're downloading this as a podcast, we just encourage you check out the movie, Unsung Hero. You can find out more by going to the website at unsunghero. Dot movie. Um, it's just an extraordinary movie that I promise you will, will take you on a journey um, 
into your soul and to really to challenge you on just how we look at life, what are things that are really important, what truly matters in this life, um, where you see a movie that, that really focuses in on our relationships matter, purpose matters, eternity matters. Um, just a great film and so honored to have both of you brothers, um, to Jonathan and to Richard. I mean, it's such a pleasure to meet you both. Um, and I look forward, I hope that you'll come back on our show because we'd love to have you back on the oh, show. Um, but if we could ever you, be you. of an assistance uh, to either one of you, please, please let us know. We want to um, we want to be an extension of what you guys are doing, um, just the great work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you yeah. so I much. I can just chime in real quick and say April 26th is opening day. So <laughs> Yes, April, April 26th. We appreciate your support. And, and let yes, me tell yes. everyone the emotions in this film are contagious. <laughs> you will feel the joy and the hope. I, I truly walked away in spite of me. Just watching that film mm -hmm. was ch changed my soul just, just in that hour and a half. So oh, I promise you, if you, you. want to feel these things, it is, um, you're going to feel And it's feel a great contagion. movie for the entire family. It's a great, mm -hmm. great movie. Yes. So um, thanks again, brothers, for being Thank with us. We are, we're honored to have you guys with us. And thanks to Matushka Trudy for... Um, uh, for producing tonight's Another show. Another unsung hero Absolutely. in the background of this show, <laughs> Someone producing who does everything. so much for us and so for all the shows here at Ancient Faith. So mm -hmm. we thank Matushka Trudy. Next Tuesday, we're dedicating a show to what we say in the Orthodox Church called Logis Me, which is basically intrusive thoughts. We're going to dedicate a show totally to studying our thoughts and how the church and the church fathers really warn us about this Logis Me, about studying our thoughts and transforming our thoughts. You don't want to miss next Tuesday's show right here on Live with the Lows. Once again, everyone, thank you so much for being with us this evening and god bless you and stay strong in your walk of faith father nick and dr roxanne are the authors of the book renewing you a priest a psychologist and a plan which can be purchased at store.ancientfaith.com their daily inspirational messages can be found at the lows.com slash subscribe be sure also to search for the lows on facebook twitter instagram and youtube Live with the Lows is a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio.